Recording started. Going to talk about some stuff from last time and um, move on into the motherboard lectures here. Let's see. Who's excited to watch PowerPoints about motherboards? I know I am. Ethan's probably very excited. Let's see, Josh is in here. Excalibur, who who are you? Uh, I'm Colton Wilcox. Colton, how you doing? Good. Feel I free am to. Unbelievably excited. Sorry for the delayed reaction. I yeah, I know it took you a second to find the words, but um, if you guys want, you can in Discord. If your Discord name is not your normal name, you can nickname yourself. Um, trying to figure out where it is. I think you right click yourself and say change nickname, and if you'll go by your your name, that will help me. Um, just at least call you the right thing. Thank you, sir. I'm perfectly willing to call you Excalibur forever if that's your nickname. It's a great one. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about motherboards. And uh, right off the bat, this is a movie reference that no one will get, probably. <clears throat> Does anyone know what film this is from? No. It's an old movie. Uh, most of the most of the time, has anybody ever seen a movie that's centered around computers or hacking or cybersecurity? No. Can you think of any? Like Mission Impossible, I guess. I don't know. Sometimes, yeah, Mission Impossible involves it. But do you ever see technology in movies and have it kind of embarrass you or annoy you with how weird it is? Ready Player One, maybe? Yeah, I actually haven't seen that. How how was that one? Oh, the movie. I mean, how, how, how are you asking in terms of like the, the plot or the how it implements technology or? What? Does it make you cringe as a technologically educated person? You know, as a person who's into this sort of stuff, does it make you cringe and go, "Oh, that's not how that works"? I mean, I guess logistically thinking about the VR uh, end of it, how it would be possible for people to be running around in the streets while also running in a simulation doesn't seem like that would be remotely possible. But. Right, right. Yeah. Well, this movie is an older one, um, maybe older than even some of you. I think it's from the 90s. And it's called Sneakers. And uh, the character Mother is that guy right there with the deal with it sunglasses. But this movie, for the time, it has a couple far-fetched sci-fi sci type ideas. But the concept is that encryption is in, in its infancy. Like, we've invented, you know, 8-bit, 24-bit encryption. We've come up with a way to securely lock down passwords and make it difficult to crack into things. But some genius mathematician comes up with an algorithm that unlocks all current um, encryption in a fraction of the time. So he builds this little box and uses this. It's sort of like the second coming of Alan Turing. If you ever heard of Alan Turing? During World War II, there was a lot of espionage. It was the first time ciphers were used in the computer. Modern computer was invented so that we could crack each other's codes. We tried to crack the German and Japanese ones, and they tried to crack ours. We were more successful. It's actually a big part of why we won the war, is we were better at listening to their communications than they were at listening to ours. And Alan Turing was one of the people who, who came up with this device that just made it faster, made it quicker to crack encryption. And Sneakers is about, like, if that happened again in the 80s or 90s, some genius comes up with it. Anyway. Massive side tangent, but really great movie for the theory of cybersecurity and what would happen if you ever really unlocked everybody's passwords at once. Basically, is that the one with, the, is that the one with Benedict Cumberbatch? Is that the one I'm thinking of? No, this no. one. I mean, you're looking at the main cast in this picture right here. It's Robert Redford, and um, that's a young River Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix's older brother, who died shortly after this film. On the left, uh, Sidney Poitier is a famous dramatic actor, like award-winning type guy. Great film. Okay. okay, on to the lesson plan. Today we're going to talk about motherboards. We normally would have a motherboard lab where we'd sit around the table and everybody would take apart the same motherboard and we'd just pass it around and everybody would share germs and that's just a no-no in 2020 because the stakes are much higher now. So we won't get to do that exactly. And then uh, we'll talk about the index build, which you'll be getting. And this is what uh, I'll have you do. Um, 
probably outside of class, but if I can set up a good streaming setup in class, you might be able to do it in class with everybody, Simran, you and uh, Javier. I have two remote students that we have to figure out how to bring you in. And then there'll be a quiz unlocked today. But first, we want to talk about desktops because we just did the desktop section. You guys mostly did very well. Class average was pretty high. And we're going to review those concepts a little bit. Well, just a reminder, taking apart a computer, you guys just had a quiz on this, so I know this is fresh. We're just going to blaze through it. But be careful with the parts. Keep things organized. Don't get hung up on jewelry. And maybe make notes if that helps you. And then uh, watch out for static electricity, humidity. Think about the conditions you're taking the computer apart in. does matter. Um, of course, backup important data. We lost Chad McBoseman this week, and we don't have a backup for him, and that makes me very sad. I've been like rewatching all of his stuff. I use a lot of Black Panther slides in my PowerPoint, so it made me extra sad. Um, moving on. We remember that step one is back up the data. Step two is power it down and unplug it. Most of you got this on the quiz. This was a pretty strong responded question. Some of the questions. Oh, and the first quiz. I put together this little chart of the survey. This is always a little strange. Uh, names are redacted, so we don't know this. But the question I ask you guys in the very first quiz is, what are some things you can fix other than computers? And, you know, one person said, my hair. Another person or two said gaming consoles. A bunch of people said food, specifically breakfast, which I wasn't sure if that was some sort of, like, come on or, or whatever. Like, yes, yeah, I'll fix your breakfast. But um, one person said they were not good at fixing their parents' marriage. That's very sad. But also that indicates a, a, a sense of humor, a dark one, but still a sense of humor. Several people listed carpentry, and a lot of people listed vehicles. And there were some aircraft models. A bunch of people said that they were capable of fixing workplace equipment, you know, um, printers at work and other devices at work, jailbroken iPhones. Pretty much all of this speaks to who you typically are as a cybersecurity or a network engineering or a systems major. You are tinkerers. You are the nosy people that get involved and fix things. Although we don't usually make tea. That person's kind of weird. And then someone, of course, pasted me the entire script of a B movie. I gave you an extra point for, for like style points on that one. Um, and then musical the equipment. Perfect, though, so you, you, you can't. I don't. I don't understand. What the movie's perfect. The movie's perfect. What, what is there to fix? Yeah, like yeah. yeah. That's what I want to know. Mm-hmm. It's it's something. Um, but anyway, this is sort of. Uh, this is kind of who we are. There's gaming consoles. There's a dark sense of humor. And then there's a tendency to tinker and fix the things around us, like curiosity and interest in how things work that other people don't have. Because I can tell you that I've had people try to come be a desktop supporter, to come be a network engineer, or come be a systems engineer, and they weren't the type. They just weren't the 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 mental type is the person who doesn't get angry and quit when they can't figure out how a thing works. They keep trying every which way until they understand every part of how that thing works. That and that curiosity and analytical mind is an asset to you in this profession. Some of the quiz questions we didn't do so well on are this one. These ports are what? First of all, they have the same shape, right? And they each have a little sort of tongue thing in the middle. They are, in fact, the same size. In the picture, they look almost the same size, but they are the same size. And then these were your answers. So this answer is obviously, right, a joke, right? And then this one's a joke. So you really only had to choose between two things. And the reason I think it's important that you guys get this sort of question right, it might seem trivial, but this is very common on the certification exam. For there to be four answers, two of them are obvious garbage, and then two of them look very similar. They sort of like to trick you this way. And I don't want you to get tripped up by this trick. And in our case, since you're allowed to Google in our class, when you miss a question like this, it just makes me think that whatever you're trying to do after you take this quiz is more important to you than the points, which is fine. Maybe, you have, maybe you've got plenty of points to spare. But 
This is easily solvable with a quick Google. So just make sure that you can get this right. This is this is not a question you should get wrong in general. It's, I mean, none of them are when you can Google. Same with this. This is obviously not a cherished memory. It is obviously not a photographic memory. It must be either standard or laptop. And a quick Google, what is the difference between laptop memory and regular memory or standard memory, will, will lead you to the answer that, oh, laptop memory memory is shorter and squatter. Butters, get out of here. Sorry, there's cat invasion. Butters, no, no, go away, Butters. Sorry, one second. I forgot to shut the door. Such is the corona experience, animals interfering. So you should be able to figure out very quickly on Google that this is not regular memory. This is laptop memory. It's shorter. The shape of it tells you. And he's instantly back. I may have to throw him out. Get out of here, dude. Okay. On to some more information about motherboards. Why are these so important? They're absolutely the central hub of the entire computer. They dictate the compatibility with every other part. If a part's not compatible with the motherboard, it's not going in the machine, period. They're not just that, though. They're also the bottleneck, meaning the tightest place, the smallest place, the limiting place. We'll get more. We'll get into that in a second. And then, of course, features. If you want a feature on a computer, the motherboard has to either have it or at least enable it or not get in the way of it be compatible with it. So part of what you have to think about is what makes sense with a motherboard. Even when parts are compatible, do they go with it? Does this make sense? Ethan, is this your car? Where did I get this? It's, it's most definitely not my car, but thanks for the compliment. Yeah. I can see you showing up to the monster truck rally in the Camry. Um, so what makes parts match together perfectly? Let's look at this one. This is the CPU. The processor is an i9 worth about 500 bucks. The memory is four gigs, which seems a little low and very cheap. And then the graphics card is at this point out of date, but decent. Actually, I think this has come down about 50 bucks. So does this combination of these three parts do they match does this make sense to you guys no why not four gigs of ram seems too low so you think four gigs of ram is not enough well that highlighter is useless four gigs of ram is not enough to go with that i9 processor right that's i mean wouldn't it throttle the i9? Yeah. Um, basically, the i9 is a big, expensive processor. That makes this computer very powerful. And typically, the minimum amount of RAM you put on a computer that's going to do you know, real work, and really the minimum on any computer, every computer that John A. buys, I'm pretty sure, is going to have 8 gigs of RAM. They don't do 4 anymore. As time goes on, software gets bigger, more demanding, screens get bigger. People demand faster performance. Computer specs go up, sort of like car horsepower goes up. And i9 is a really, really nice, expensive processor, and 4 gigs is absolutely bottom of the barrel. So yes, the bottleneck here is definitely this 4 gigs of RAM. The 1070 is not a hyper-expensive graphics card also. It's a little out of place here. Basically, what is the simplest thing you could change. Take money out of the equation. What's the one thing you, if you could only change one thing about this setup to make it make sense, what would you change? Add RAM. Go to eight is one way. What if you just back that processor down to an i5 or an i3? Then the machine kind of makes sense also. Although the t then the 1070 is sort of like, why am I here? What, what, what would I do to deserve being in this garbage machine? So let's look at another one. Very quickly, what about this one? You have a cheap i3 processor. You have 64 gigs of RAM, which is more expensive than the processor. And then you have a GTX 1050. Does this one make any sense? 
Even if it's easy, feel free to throw it out. I'd probably go for a better CPU. Yeah. You bring this up to an i5, the machine is still kind of wacky, but if this is an i5 or an i7, and maybe the RAM comes down to 32 gigs, and maybe you spend a little more on the graphics card, let's look at a machine that actually kind of makes sense. Uh, and this is your sub $2,000 gaming PC, basically. Okay, sorry, I gotta take a break. He just won't leave. And now my lecture recording forever has a cat yelling in the background. Beautiful. So this computer is a pretty nice standard setup. It's an i7. It's a good processor, better than average, strong enough to run anything you could ever want to do. 16 gigs of RAM is sort of like the sweet spot for gaming. You could go with 8 gigs in an office computer that's just going to do Microsoft Word and Excel and web browser and stuff like that. But sometimes for gaming PCs, you want 16 because the game and Windows will hog all of the 8 eight or so gigabytes, and then the other eight is kind of to run other applications in the background. So far, there's no game that quite hogs this much, although Skyrim modded into the stratosphere, maybe. And then graphics card, this is a super nice graphics card. GTX 2080 goes very well with these two, and this is a gaming machine that can handle anything you throw at it. Okay. So what I want you to be able to do is to glance at a motherboard to look at a motherboard and instantly understand some things about it. Not everything. You got to look up the details. But you should be able to look at this motherboard and tell me what it's for. Like, what is this motherboard for? Anybody? It says Tomahawk Arctic on it. Does that mean it only works in the Arctic Circle? I wish. Probably okay. Just yeah. What makes it, what makes, what about it makes you think it's gaming? The aesthetic. Aesthetic, yep. It looks cool. It has lights. Purely bis non-gaming motherboards do not bother to look cool. This has these gray and white lines on it. Everything has kind of a color theme to it. There's uh, any, any kind of lighting like this. So feature-wise, we look at this motherboard and we instantly see, okay, one, two, three, four memory slots, right? The processor would go here, kind of in the center. And then this first slot is probably for the graphics card, and that's probably the fastest, like PCIe. And then you have some smaller expansion slots, but there's a lot of them. You can put two graphics cards in here, an SLI, meaning they operate as one together. You can put a bunch of Wi-Fi cards, USB cards. This is a very featureful motherboard. It's probably 100 or 200 bucks for this guy when it was new. The other thing I want you to be able to do is identify those features. Like when I say, how many RAM slots? You go, oh, four. And how many expansion slots? You say, well, three full size and then three little guys. And then configuring a BIOS, we're going to talk more about later. UEFI is kind of the same thing. Maintenance, we'll discuss then replacing the CMOS battery. It's this little guy here. Does anybody know why motherboards have a tiny battery on them? I'm not sure just to keep uh, the clock accurate. They don't um, they don't store many settings. They're not designed to have much memory stored on them. So if you pull off the battery and you turn on the computer, it will not know what date it is or what time. It'll probably think it's somewhere around whenever the motherboard's earliest recorded date is. It used to be you'd pull the battery on a computer and it would think it was the year 1900. For some reason, that's just when they start counting. So without this, it can't remember anything. So it's very useful for that. That's what the CMOS does. We'll talk about that in a second. So form factor. Every motherboard's got a specific form factor, meaning what case does it fit into? What shape is it? What processor socket does it have? What types of processors can interface with it? What types of memory 
does it interface with? What speeds of memory can it handle? Although motherboards and memory both will throttle down to their their common speed. So if you have 3200 memory, and your motherboard only likes 2600, the memory will slow itself down. They'll agree on a speed and go that. Buses and bus slots we're going to talk about in a second. And then we'll talk a little bit about ports. So when we talk about form factors, we mostly mean size. A little bit about shape. If you're building a very small, very compact PC, these mini boards are great. They're also pretty cheap. These boards are $50 to $60 for the motherboard. Then you spend $80 to $100 on a cheap processor. You can build a computer, a complete computer, for three or $400 that does quite a lot of cool things. And then most of your gaming builds, your, your medium-sized builds, are going to be in the micro or the full ATX area just because they hold more memory. You see there's two slots on this tiny guy. There's four here, four here, three big expansion card slots, two here. It just gets bigger and bigger. And when you look at EATX, can you think of what type of machines those would go in? Anybody got an idea? Would it be uh, servers? Servers is one great example. A server is a computer. Is A server really just means somebody else's computer. So a server is out there on the internet, probably with no monitor or screen attached to it, and it's just hosting a website or it's storing files, or it's a game server, or doing something like that. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily need a nice front end. They pro servers usually don't have graphics cards that are very big, but they have mountains of memory. This thing has eight RAM slots, and looks I can't tell, but it looks like a Threadripper slot. They're kind of wacky. And this one is definitely a just a monstrous gaming machine. But uh, most of those we're going to talk about are either workstations or servers. The other one is, of course, workstation. And when the book or when the CompTIA certification says workstation, think Photoshop machine. Think video editor. Think any kind of computing process that needs tons of power but is not video games. And that's a workstation. So... It's right there in the title. It's for work, like serious work, like your average secretary, accountant, business person, professor, most people in the organization, most people at John A. Logan do not need a workstation class computer. But the graphic designers need one. The architects need one. Um, your video editing, your media department, they need one. And also, it, this goes for labs, too. If you, if John A. Logan, I, I assume somewhere John A.'s got like a slightly elevated spec lab full of workstations, not regular computers. And they're a work, it's really just a term that you apply to it. You say, oh, well, I want 30 computers in here. You're probably getting 8 gigs of RAM and i5 processors. But if you tell the technician, no, I want 30 workstations in here, we're going to teach Photoshop, we're going to teach Adobe Premiere, we're going to teach more complicated stuff. You say, I want 30 workstations in there. That implies that I want 16 or 30 gigs of RAM. I want decent graphics cards. I want big monitors. So, don't have to memorize this. This is the sort of stuff that I still Google when I'm looking at a case, oh, this fits. PC Part Picker helps you with a lot of it. But this is the sort of chart you're going to look up. Like an ATX, basically if, if a board is 12 by 9, it's probably an ATX. If it's smaller than that, it's like 9 by 9, see it's square instead of rectangle, then we call that a micro. And then there's mini down to just under 7 inches. Very, very small. NLX, I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen one of those, but that's very small. So, the processor socket. This is where the processor goes into the motherboard. And if you've never removed or installed a processor, you really just sort of line it up and drop it in. You let gravity do the work. This one, you can see it has pinholes. We're going to talk about the different types. But this is a zero insertion force socket, which the name is its that because it does take no force to install the process. You just put it in the right place and let gravity pull it down into it. And they say that also because they don't want you using force. If it doesn't go in with gravitational force, then you don't have it positioned right and you're about to break it. So don't do that. 
It has to completely and perfectly fit in the slot. If you look, this thing has sort of these strange angled edges. It's not actually square. And one of them is marked with this tiny indentation. You see at each one of the corners, it's flat black plastic. And then at this corner, there's a tiny little triangular indentation. The processor has a matching triangle and you make sure that it's on that corner and it'll drop right in every time. You just lift up this clamp, drop the processor in, put the clamp back down and you're done. Once you've done it once and you're no longer afraid of it, it's pretty easy. Uh, and actually both of them, this is wrong, I need to update this slide. Both of them like LGA, this day. AMD's pretty much abandoned PGA. Now what is PGA? It is not the uh, golfing association. Oops, second, this text needs to be moved. Uh, discard this annotation. Sorry, one second. Got to fix this. And you, backwards. Boop. And this little logo over here. And there we go. So pin grid array is what we're just looking at here. And you see, look, blank plastic, blank plastic, tiny, very subtle indentation, blank plastic. So pins aligned in uniform rows around the socket. There are little pins on the processor that look like this. Those have to drop down into those hundreds or thousands of holes, okay? Has to perfectly match up. This is what the two different types look like in comparison to each other. LGA just kind of drops down and presses against the uh, motherboard and then is clamped into place. PGA has these pins that insert into the holes. And what can happen with PGAs is they can be ruined. If you're rough with it, if you accidentally set it on something, drop it on something, or you try to force it the wrong direction. This is the indicator triangle, by, by the way, the little golden triangle there. This is what happens. This processor is, processor is ruined. You would never, even if you straighten these, they might not make a connection anymore, and then you could just never trust this processor. So with a very slight amount of damage, this is ruined. Now, LGA looks a little, little different. You just kind of set it in here, and instead of the indicator triangle, it has these notches. See? It's square, but then there's a notch on each side. This prevents you from putting the processor in the wrong way. And you can see it's got notches here. This is a thread ripper. It's a big, giant processor. And, uh, yeah. Hmm. I think I actually changed fonts on my computer and that has caused some of the text to be thrown off. So I'm sorry, but I have to make the quickest imaginable edit here to fix my stuff. And send backward, there we go. So the chipset is a bunch of chips that are permanently attached to the motherboard and you don't need to understand everything about them. You just need to understand that when Intel designs a motherboard, there's kind of half a computer built into it already. How it handles instructions, how it uses and utilizes memory, how it handles graphics cards, how it connects to everything. And this, this defines the abilities of a motherboard and the function of it is these chips. This is an example of a map of in, one of Intel's boards. Okay? So you can see at the center here is the processor. Over here on this bus is the PCI length. This is where the graphics card goes. This is just a theoretical map. Obviously, this doesn't look anything like the motherboard. Then, on a separate line, is the DDR3. This is the memory over here. Okay? And it's got a separate bus for each channel to get maximum speed about it. And then, if you have an independent display, it has that available. If you don't use a graphics card, these are the other... PC, this is the other PCI Express bus, and all of this runs through a separate chipset. So the processor's up here, and then it talks to this bunch of other chips, and it says, you guys you guys handle it. I don't want to think about all these lesser devices. I don't care. I'm a snob. I am the processor. I only care about the graphics card and the memory. So you give me 16 gigs of RAM, and you give me that GTX 2080, and I am happy. And then when you're talking about Ethernet, Wi-Fi, the mouse, the keyboard, I don't care. You, Intel chipset, that's your job. I delegate that to you. That's basically how the relationship of these devices together. Every time Intel or AMD changes 
a chipset, a motherboard design. They come up with a name for it. Sometimes it's the internal code name. Sometimes it's the public name. One that they used for a while was called Sandy Bridge. And the CPU holds the memory and the graphics controller, just like on the map we just saw. It uses DDR3. We're now up to DDR5 on motherboards. 4 is pretty commonplace. So this is sort of old. Ivy Bridge is another one they designed. This was another performance gain. Like everything that we talk about in this class, someone will have invented a thing and then they will make a new version of it. They will invent the 66 Mustang and then they will go, no, 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 that's not good enough. The 67 Mustang now has more horsepower, it is available in more colors and is cooler, has better air conditioning, whatever. So they come out with Sandy Bridge and they're like, eh, it's okay. We come out with Ivy Bridge, and then next year we're coming out with another new thing. That is the sort of endless improvement race that Intel is in with itself and with AMD, with any competitors. And then you come over, and this is another one of their architectures. Pretty much the same. Actually, this is a similar representation of the same one we just saw. You see that the CPU talks to one chipset up here. Uh, this is basically the newer version of the previous one we saw. So CPU, the, the processors here, you got your i5, your i3, your i7 processor up here, and it's talking to the North Bridge, and then it talks to the graphics card and the RAM. And then for anything less important than that, again, the BIOS, USB, the network, all that stuff, that's South Bridge. Because the graphics card needs very fast access to the processor. It needs this proximity. It needs this high level of access to perform it at the way we expect it to. And the, mem the memory enables both of these. If the memory is farther away, then the processor will be waiting on it. And that will slow the whole machine down. That would be what we call a bottleneck. And then down here, the lesser devices, you're like, Wi-Fi, man, that's so much easier to handle than the 3D card. You can be on the South Bridge. Okay. Another device you need to be aware of, there's one of these in every computer at John A. It's called the TPM chip, Trusted Platform Module. And what it what it is, is cybersecurity has become such, most of your cybersecurity majors, you know this, cybersecurity is such an important part of computing now. Between the, it used to be in the infancy of the computer days, it was independent hackers. But these days, it's government-sanctioned organizations. It's Russia. It's China. They're into everything. They're stealing everything. Um, they are into politics. They are into money. They're into, you know, copyrights and everything like this. It's, it's a disaster. But it's created an industry for you to thrive in, protecting people's computers. The TPM chip is a crucial part of it. Part of the way you protect your information is you encrypt it. So if someone doesn't have the key, your files are gibberish. They're meaningless. They're useless. So a TPM chip helps you facilitate this. It does the encrypting and the decrypting. It stores the keys. This helps on older machines. Originally, I think part of the function of a TPM chip was to take some of the load off of the main processor because encrypting took a bit of horsepower. When we first encrypted at SIU, this is probably true of John A. also, we first encrypted... A lot of people had 10 or 11-year-old, like, terrible Dell computers, GX270s, very weak, 2 and 4 gigs of RAM. They were not very powerful computers. And so when we turned encryption on, the computer got very slow because all day long, it is encrypting and decrypting its own files to protect them. And so newer machines would have a TPM chip. The TPM chip would do part of that work. Also, the newer machines just had i5s and i7s, which are so powerful compared to the previous chips, that they handle it without really any, any performance hit. And then you add in things like solid-state drives, speeding up the whole process, and it's not an issue anymore. Encryption is barely a performance hit, usually, on most machines nowadays. But the TPM chip still handles it. And sometimes Dell computers, when they come, every, every once in a while, will have one where the TPM chip is just off, or if you reset the BIOS, the TPM gets shut off and the machine won't encrypt and then it won't function on our network because our security is such that if the machine's not encrypted, it can't do anything. Okay. 
The other thing that can lock down is some cases, including most of our newer Dells and stuff like that, have chassis intrusion measures. They can tell when the case has been opened. They can tell when chips have been moved around or anything has been changed physically inside the case because in cybersecurity, some, it's something that we generally accept is that if an enemy gets physical access to the machine, it's over. You lose. If, if a hacker, instead of hacking into your computer, breaks into your house and carries it out and takes it back to their house, whatever's on there, they will eventually have. Because given enough time, given physical access, they will be able to break in. So part of what you do in a lab setting or any setting where you're worried about people messing with your machines is have chassis intrusion features on. So if someone opens up the case and tries to change something or add something or break in to, to it or shut off TPM or shut off any security features, the computer just goes into lockdown. It initiates a, a bit locker hold and the machine's just useless if you break into it like that. It's kind of a cool feature. It's also really annoying if you forget it's there and a customer's like, I want a new video card so I can have an extra monitor. And you're like, cool, and you just do it and you lock their machine because you forget to shut off the chassis intrusion settings. It can happen to you. So buses. What is a bus? In motherboard terms, it's a pathway. In this example, we're using Northbridge Southbridge again. Let's see. This is the processor over here where it says front side. This is the memory. This is the AGP. Now, the bus is part of the motherboard. It's physically soldered onto it. It is like a street in your city. And the motherboard is the city. The bus is the street. It dictates how fast you can go, where you can go, how you get to where you want to go. And if it's a narrow two-lane street with lots of potholes, you're not going there very fast. And if it's a wide eight-lane freeway that's just been repaved and it's lightning fast, you're probably going to get there quickly. It works the same way. And so they also carry power, control signals, meaning this device tells this device, tell the memory to send me the thing. The memory goes, here's the thing you wanted, and it sends it back. So certain devices control the bus. They dictate what's moving across it. How wide it is is how many just lanes on a street. Just think of a highway. And I can think of a few times, let's see, where having something on the wrong bus mattered. It's rare anymore. Motherboards try to compensate. They try to, because they know that we are dumb, we the customer who builds computers, and we just put things in whatever slot they will fit in. But I built a VR computer that worked great. It had a nice graphics card, and it had plenty of memory, and it had a VR headset, and you could play whatever you wanted on it, and it was completely smooth. And then I added a wireless card to work with the VR headset, because normally the VR headset, you had like a 10 or 20-foot tether on it. That's how it got all of its power, and its video is, it was, act your head was actually tied to the computer, which is awkward. You could get it twisted, you could get it snagged and it limited how far away from the computer you could get. So we hooked up the wireless system and every time you started up VR, the computer would freeze. The cursor would freeze. It was basically, it wasn't even blue screen. It would just freeze. Very hard crash. And what we figured out was that that little VR wireless card was down here on the PCI bus. And so, and the graphics card was over here on another bus. But that little wireless card needed to be on its own separate bus. It needed to be on a motherboard that, or on a bus that was not shared with any other device because it was so much data. It was VR quality video and sound, and it needed to go fast. And so we switched the motherboard out, put the card on its own separate, a bigger motherboard was put in with more slots, and we looked at a map of the motherboard and went, okay, Slots one and two are on bus one. Slots three and four are on bus two. So we put this little hog of a wireless card on its own bus, and suddenly it was fine. It worked fine. The battery life was still trash, so we didn't end up using it, but it worked. So buses are not a thing you usually have to troubleshoot, but when stuff gets really weird, it's something to consider. 
And we measure these in hertz, megahertz, gigahertz. This is why when you hear about a processor going 1.3 gigahertz, you're like, oh, that's how fast it can think. And it is limited by the motherboard. If the motherboard can't go beyond a certain speed, then neither can the processor. They are all limited by the lowest common denominator. Whoever is the slowest person, that's how fast the group is going. So if he's going at 100, and he's going 100, and he's going 100, and the memory on the motherboard only goes 50, we are all going 50 because that's the slowest part. So that's how that works. And there's Michael Stipe singing Everybody Hurts. One time I thought that was funny. I might take that one out. Let's see. This is a chart you don't have to memorize or take notes on. This is the sort of chart you look up when you're looking for compatibility to compare specs. And this is also, I left this in, this is from the book actually, um, to show you the iteration. You see PCI was a thing down here and it had this much data path, this much maximum speed. Or you see we're in megabytes down here. This is 0.5 gigabytes. So then we came up with PCI Express and we thought that was hot stuff. Then we have PCI uh, Express, X Express, 3.0, 4.0 is not, that should be out by now. This is an old slide. So again, we invent a thing down here and every half year or year, as we, as we improve upon it, we get a new version. This is why I say that your knowledge is never safe in this business. You must be learning and reading, watching YouTube videos about what is new, what is coming, what is in development, what is being tested. Because whatever you think you know today will be obsolete in a couple of months, and you'll look like a dingus if you walk in and, and go, yeah, I got PCI Express 2.0 and everybody's on 3.0. It's just the nature of computers. Something called Moore's Law existed for a long time. It was kind of cute. Just showed how fast we could develop technology. Eventually, it it was it fell off. But uh, but this is kind of the arc. You see, back in the '90s, we invented a thing, and we have improved its speed and performance every year since. And this is kind of what the curve looks like for really any technology. This is what it's always going to look like: is a giant curve upward. And this is a hideous graphic, but it's the best one I've ever found to show the different sizes. For a while, we went AGP. We we're like, oh, PCI, that's so trash. I go AGP. And it was really the same thing, just a different kind of format, different design. And then we're back on PCI Express nowadays. Um, some of them are backwards compatible. One of the things you have to look up is when someone says, will this card work with this motherboard? The correct response is, I don't know, because there's no way you know. But you can figure it out. You get the exact model number of the card, what type of bus it requires, and then you look at the motherboard and go, oh, your card requires a PCI Express 16 slot, and this motherboard has one. So yes, the answer is now yes. I have found the answer. It will work. Okay. Now we're going to try to start identifying. Remember I said I want you to be able to look at a motherboard and be able to guess some things about it just by looking at it. So here we see there are PCI Express 16 slots. They're longer. Doesn't really matter what color they are. And then this one is a conventional PCI slot. And then we have uh, PCI X1 slots, these little guys. This one's a times four, this one's a times one. So if you have a card that says it's PCI X times one, put it here. It doesn't need anything better than that. If you have a giant graphics card that's PCI Express 16, it definitely must go here. You also want these clamps. This little white clamp at the end holds it in place. So that's important for big, heavy cards to not wobble sideways. But you should be able to look at this and not necessarily know exactly what speed these are but be able to figure out what goes where just by looking because they're des they've designed it so that you can visually identify stuff. Okay, the CMOS is the technical term for the battery, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It means battery and it stores configuration data and it also sends out the pulse to sync components. 
So without it, the computer will act very strange or not work at all. Uh, mostly, if your CMOS battery is dead, then your system clock is wrong every day. That's your that's your big clue that the CMOS battery needs to be replaced. And these are like eight to ten dollars. Your John A. Logan tech office probably has a drawer with a hundred of them in them that all have half charge. You see, it's a twenty thirty two. All computers, almost all computers, use a twenty thirty two. It's a camera battery. Okay. So we're going to do a little exercise with the folks we have in the channel. Appreciate everybody coming tonight. I know it's not class night and you're here optionally just to be helpful. I really appreciate it. So looking at motherboards and identifying what they do. Let's start with this one and feel free to cheat. If you can read upside down, what is this motherboard for? There are several clues. Anybody? A workstation. It is a workstation. What was your clue? Don't be afraid. Uh, well, it says a uh, workstation. On it, it says workstation. That's clear, clearly that's what I would use if I was in a room with a customer and they said, what is this? I'd look and it says a workstation, obviously. <laughs> I pretend like I was very smart. So what's another clue that this is a workstation board, a subtler one? Um, general uh, coloring and aesthetic. Makes it, it uh, kind, of, kind of betrays it, I guess. It looks serious, right? It looks business like. Yeah. It doesn't look like a gaming board. It doesn't have any like pizzazz necessarily. What? It that's a very has, subtle clue. It also has both the DVI and VGA, which aren't typically used for game on gaming PCs. It has some older video ports. True. Uh, it's, it's. Can you see any other subtle clues? That's a that's a good one. I actually hadn't thought of that one. The aesthetic. What about generally the size and um, the slots of it? It's definitely not a compact board, right? It's got four RAM slots, multiple video slots. What about this card? Does anybody know what type of card this is? It's an NVIDIA Quad Pro, all right? Quadro, yeah. Yeah, Quadro. It is. It is a Quadro, and... Uh, have you ever... Has anybody ever had any experience with a Quadro? They're not... For, they're a... Very high-end graphics card. They're extremely expensive, but they're not for gaming. They're for software development, programming, something like that. Uh, yeah, to some extent. Mostly, though, graphics and video. This yeah, thing, rendering. Yes, rendering is exactly the right word. This thing is when you are making a movie trailer or editing a film or editing graphics. You're making a brochure. You're a graphic designer. You're a video editor. Um you're a 3D renderer, you're an architect, anybody that needs more power but is not interested in playing video games, the Quadro card is designed for them. It's not designed for maximum frame rate in video games. It has a crap load of memory on it. This Quadro probably has 32 or 64 gigs of RAM in it, but load of RAM in it, whereas your average gaming video card would be faster than the Quadro but only have probably 4 to 10 gigs of VRAM. It's just the difference between uh, a Ford Mustang car and an F-150. This is an F-150. This will tow a heavy, heavy thing uphill. The Mustang will not. But also, this is not as fun or as fast as the Mustang. So, that's a workstation. This one's pretty clear. What's this motherboard for? Gaming. Yeah, obviously, because of the all of the style and and frankly, silliness. Just the Strix series is really gaudy. <laughs> uh, does anybody think this looks ugly or beautiful, or what do you think of it? It's a, it's a nice motherboard. I, I have that motherboard, so I have to say it looks nice. You have that motherboard, so you have to say it looks nice. I appreciate your honesty. Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking about that. Oh. Uh, it's most certainly a motherboard that you would put inside of your Windows or Linux PC. Huh. Okay. Really? I would put this um, in a Mac. Really? Would you? Yeah. You'd, you'd go Hackintosh with your uh, yeah. Asus Strix? I would yeah. throw it in my toaster oven. You know, that is, and, and this, keep in mind, this is coming from a kid who had a Mac in 1984 and is known as the Mac guy at SIU. But that's probably the only way you could make a Mac that wasn't dog shit at video games is to make a Hackintosh out of a Strix. 
<laughs> it would be it would be awesome. Like you know, Macs just don't ever put the right hardware in their machines. Apple never does for for gaming. It's frustrating. Okay. I may as well revert to an Apple II at that point. I well, Apple. I played a shitload of. I played Load Runner on my Apple II. It was awesome. Okay, this guy. Uh, first of all, that picture is way lower resolution than I thought it would be, but you can tell what it is, right? Like a mini. This gaming. is yeah. This is a tiny Another guy. It, it definitely has some gaming flair to it, but look how compact it is. Look how dense this area is. This is made for a tiny computer. I can't really tell because the quality of the picture kind of sucks. That just does it, huh? That just ruins it for you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Stand on my insecurities. I appreciate you. What is this? Let's see. 480p? Yeah. I mean, maybe even worse. Uh, well, I wanted to get a new graphic. The old graphic was even worse. I'm slowly replacing through the PowerPoints all of the book's pictures because they make me sad. Okay. This motherboard. What do you think we got this out of? Said Dell. Yeah. So if there was one word you could use to describe this, it would be either Dell or boring. It says yeah. Dell. It says Dell on it, for one thing. That's your first clue. But also, there's no aesthetic flair to it. It doesn't have an amazing amount of slots or ports. It's definitely not a workstation board, right? There's not enough memory slots. Not enough space to add things to it. This is probably what the motherboard in the computer's and most of the labs that John A look like because they're just normal standard computers. Nothing wrong with that, but that's what they are. And can everybody quickly tell where the CMOS is? Right. right below. Remember where the CMOS is? It's the silver yep. circle. It's the battery, mid left. Okay. Much easier to do that sort of stuff in the in the physically in the room where I say point to the CMOS and you all just point and go duh. All right. What is this motherboard for? It's a server. Why do you think that? Uh, it has two CPU sockets. Yeah, that's crazy, right? It's a dual CPU socket. And each one of those CPUs these days looks like, kind of looks like Threadripper sockets to me because they have that weird indentation in the center, which is a very expensive processor that has like 12 or 16 cores in the first place. So this is going to make a monster of a computer. What's another thing that it has multiple of that's not normal? PCIe. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven full-size PCI slots because they just don't bother putting the little micro reduced size ones in. They don't bother it. Here's the CMOS, by the way, a little silver circle. And then what's another thing it has multiple of that's, that's an indicator? RAM. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight RAM slots. And for the for the full crown, what's another thing it has too many of? Give your hand to talk here. Yep, it has multiple Ethernet ports. Only a server board would have that. Even a workstation would not have that. There's no reason for a workstation, a gaming computer, a regular person's computer to connect to multiple networks like this. But if you were running a server, you totally might want this. This thing could be your router. It could be your firewall, your file storage. You could be using it as a internet bridge. Like say you have Mediacom coming in on this port and you have fiber coming in on this port. And then just for amusement to make fun of them you have frontier coming in on this port and it never matters and then this monster load balances all of that and everyone in your business who's all graphic designers or whatever they are their all of their internet traffic goes through this beast of a machine with its 30 processors and 150 gigs of ram it's a monster that's definitely a server this would be a tremendous waste to build a personal computer out of this you would never utilize most of it and what is this thing? This is a very nerdy question. What is this? Raspberry Pi. It is, there's the there is the big nerd in the channel. Thank you. Sorry. I'm proud of you. I, Thank you. You're getting bonus points for being a big nerd. So what the hell is a Raspberry Pi? Can you describe to me what it is? Raspberry Pi. Oh, go ahead, Ethan. I, I was just making a dumb joke. Continue. <laughs> Raspberry Pi is like a small computer. You can 
load different types of operating systems on it. Uh, Ubuntu, they have a Windows 10 version that kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, I put Windows 10 Enterprise on mine. It worked. You can do RetroPie. You can play all like the old Atari games. Yeah. On it. So this is a complete computer, right? Yep. This is a processor that is not removable. It has somewhere on here, I'm not sure which piece it is, it has memory. It might be this chunk here. It has USB ports, an Ethernet port. The newer ones have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. And then this is where you connect the monitor. This is HDMI. This is where you typically connect power via USB. And then this is a headphone jack to connect to speakers. This is a complete computer. It's all you need, and they're 50 bucks. They're really fun to experiment with. And just set up other, you know, install random versions of Linux or whatever you feel like doing. These are so cool. And the newer ones, the Pi 4 is pretty powerful, I guess. I don't have one. The, the Pi 4, I think, goes up to 4 gigs of RAM. That's awesome. I, I'll get one eventually. I still have a Pi 3 in that translucent case. It looks really cool. I love that thing. It has a little fan for no reason. So that's a Raspberry Pi. Okay. Now we have to talk about BIOS. BIOS is the first thing that pops up on a computer when it posts. When in class, when we're trying to see if a computer posts or your home computer, the computer that's right in front of you right now, when you turn it on, the first thing that shows up on the screen is the BIOS saying, hello, I have power, I have a motherboard, and I'm going to try to turn on your computer now. And it does it. It's It goes, okay, there's this much memory, there's this much processor, there's this much graphics card, and then I go, oh, I have... Windows 10 right here. I'll start that up. Or I have Linux. Or I have the Mac OS. The Mac OS has a BIOS too. It just hides it all from me because Apple doesn't trust you. And nor should they. So on an old PC, it looks like this BIOS on the left and the mouse doesn't work. You navigate it with the arrow keys and enter is yes and escape is no. That's how old BIOSes work. So if you ever have to mess with an old computer, like it's booting from the wrong drive or it won't boot from your usb or the ethernet port is just off for some reason it could be a bio setting that you need to reset or you can just set it as default and that will fix it so you have to get into this old ugly bios newer bioses usually the mouse works keyboard works if it's connected and everything's clickable it's kind of like being in the windows control panel although it's a little scarier than that there's a lot of options in a BIOS that will scare you. But usually when you are messing with a computer's BIOS, you're there for one thing. There's one thing that's not working or needs to be clicked on or off. So just focus on that thing and ignore the other 99% of stuff. Definitely don't get sidetracked and try clicking random buttons the way Ethan does. That would be very bad. Curiosity can hurt you in here. What? I don't know. That, that was absolute slander. Ethan's got no, <laughs> no history of foolish behavior with BIOSes. That was absolutely unfair of me. I will not stand for this slander. Do not. Nor should you. Nor should you, slander my names. Okay, sorry. I apologize. So this is, let me bring this over here. This is a BIOS simulator. These exist online for reasons that I don't understand other than I use them in class. But again, normally you couldn't use a mouse and keyboard with this, but this is kind of how the old BIOS has worked. You would come in here and you would you would say, oh, look, the first boot device is the hard drive. If it can't find Windows there, it looks for a CD. We used to install operating systems on CDs. It took forever. It should never be done again. It was horrible. And so then there's floppy drives. This, this theoretical computer has a floppy drive. This is just a relic from a, a time long past. Um, but this is how you would do it. You would go in here, you would change the settings. You would say, yeah, I want this drive to be the boot drive. And then you would hit F10 to save and exit. And the computer would reboot and your changes would be stored in the CMOS. It would be stored in the BIOS, but the CMOS would keep the settings saved. Okay? This is what they look like. And these are these are out there if you ever need one. You shouldn't. But they exist. Now, this is a helpful chart, although it's out of date. Um, every computer, every PC, and every motherboard has a button you can mash when you first turned it on to select the boot device. Normally, the BIOS picks the boot device, and the BIOS normally will pick the first hard drive it sees. 
or the first storage device of whatever type it sees. So when you turn on your computer, without asking you, the BIOS is looking at your hard drive and saying, hey, Windows, start up. It's time to get to work. But if you press the power button to your computer and then you very quickly hit the boot key, usually I'm never I'm never sure of the timing, so I just hit the boot key a bunch of times. I just tap, 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 tap. I just wail on it. And this will bring you either into the BIOS or into the boot menu. Now, if you look at certain brands of computers, like F12 is always the boot key for Dells, pretty much. F2 is always the BIOS key for them. But when you sit down and someone brings you their PC and they're like, it's broken, and you want to look at the BIOS, you need to know what kind of motherboard they have. So you're going to turn it on. It's going to pop up. And you guys, in class, you'll notice that your, your turd computers will pop up and say, Asus BIOS. And you're like, okay, now I know it's an Asus. That means that the BIOS key is probably F2. So I'll start it up again and hit F2 or delete to get to the BIOS. But this chart, you know, people try to make these, but the trouble is the manufacturers obsolete them all the time. But if you work at a company, say you work at a company where every single computer there is a Acer, then you just learn these. Like I've worked for, I've worked with John A. Logan and SIU for years now, and they're almost all Dells. So that's why I have memorized F12. That's what it is usually. Now, again, a modern BIOS, we take a little closer look here. I can change what drive it boots from. I can temporarily boot from a USB. Like if, if I wanted to install Linux, I would put Linux on a little USB flash drive. And then I would plug that flash drive in, reboot, and tell the BIOS, hey, boot from that little USB guy because I'm going to install Linux from it. And it would start up from that instead of the hard drive. That's how you install operating systems these days. It's much easier. It's also possible to tell the BIOS to start up via the network, but there has to be a server on your network or accessible somewhere that has an operating system that's designed to be net booted from. Some places try to do this. It's called, you know, we try to do VDI or virtualization, you know, where there's a central computer, a server with one of those big monster server motherboards, tons of memory, tons of processors, awesome everything. And then your computers in the lab are all just absolute garbage. They don't really have a hard drive. They don't have an operating system. Um, and they pull their operating system every time. Every time you turn them on, the BIOS jumps on the Ethernet and goes, can anybody boot me, please? Thank you. And the server goes, here you go, dude. Here's a little mini operating system for you to boot. It's a cool way to work. Um, it's a little slower. It relies on the server speed and the network speed. And if those are down, then you have no computer. You just have a bunch of bricks that can do nothing on their own. Another interesting thing you might not know about Apple's is they can all netboot across from anywhere in the world online. They can netboot and reinstall their OS for free. Kind of a nice feature. Um, of course, they are more expensive and weirder, and there's there's downsides to Apple's. There's plenty of them, but it's a really cool feature if you're ever a technician and someone's like, I need this Mac reinstalled, and nobody knows how or how to reinstall, or nobody has the right media, nobody has a, a USB drive or a CD with a Mac OS on it. You can literally get it online, either Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and net boot it from Apple, from the mothership, wipe the drive, and say, install the Mac OS, and it'll do it. It takes a while. It's usually an hour or two. That's saved my life twice. It's awesome. I honestly, I'm like, I don't see why Dell couldn't do that for their machines. You know, like yeah. give give us a baseline install. They have the service. They can pull the service tag, and go give me the original license of Windows that this shipped with. You know, there's they could totally do it, but so far only Apple has done that that I know of. Okay. This is this animated GIF is just flipping through the various screens of a BIOS, and you can see that this one is very fancy. It has a this is probably a gaming motherboard. Yeah, this looks like a a pretty fancy ASUS gaming motherboard. And you see, I can change advanced settings, stuff about the monitors. I can change the overclocking. I have the date and time here, so I know that that's accurate. I have a bunch of other features. Aura is like the lights that are on the motherboard, the fancy, like this is, it's sort of what you pay for these days in gaming cards is one of the main features, a selling point of some gaming motherboards is, oh, this BIOS 
is very pleasant to work in, very easy to understand, and it has tons of features. You can change everything about your motherboard settings. And a lot of people like that. If you understand that, like you can change the fan speeds. If you want the whole machine to be quieter, set the fans to 90%, set the power to 90% so that you don't make too much heat. Um, I actually do this. I have sort of a BIOS control for my graphics card because I have one of the very, very early RTX 2080s. And it has three fans, and it sounds like a small airplane taking off if it ever maxes out. Like if I play something at 3440 with maximum resolution, my graphics card sounds like a lawnmower on my desk. And it doesn't need to because the graphics card is so powerful. It's actually incorrectly thinking that it needs to go to full fan speed. So what I do is I get into the graphics card's little BIOS, and I say, limit your power to 80%. And then I also limit the fan speeds to to go along with that. So the card is absolutely silent. I never hear it. And I don't miss that extra 20% of power. It's sort of a misconfiguration. Like the factory made this card. They're like, at the first hint of effort, absolutely max out the fans to sound awesome. And it doesn't sound awesome. Okay. That's that bit on the motherboards. The motherboard quiz, um, if it's not unlocked right now, I will go unlock it right now when we're done here. Here's another T'Challa slide, because I'm very sad that he's gone. Can you uh, stop making me sad, please? Thanks. Uh, look, man, there's grief is a poop. You have to get it out. You can't hold it in, and you can't force it out faster. I already got it out. I can't get out anymore. Ah, uh, I still have a bit to go. Okay. I'm sorry, Ethan. I promise no more T'Challa slides. Oops. You monster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to unlock the next quiz. And tomorrow we're going to meet in class. I'm going to try to bring a webcam and set it up on Discord so either of our remote students can join us for that time if they'd like. And I will see you guys at your appointed time. Some of you is tomorrow at 5 or 6, and some of you is Wednesday at 5 or 6. Um, and if you forget your time, it's the same as last week. But if you forgot that, because it was all a blur of incredible learning and inspiring experience, then I can look it up on our emails, okay? Thank you all for coming to participate. I appreciate all of you. And uh, see you in class sometime. I have a Oh, Simran, go ahead. Yeah, I, if like you're gonna come tomorrow with the webcam, you will yeah. be sent a Discord a message. Yes, I will warn you. I will. Uh, I'll send you an email. I, I, I. Which section are you normally? Are you actually enrolled in Simran Tuesday or Wednesday? I'm in the Wednesday one. I Wednesday think. one. Okay, I can set it up either time. Is there one that's better for you? Anything is fine with me. Okay. Well, I, I will probably try it tomorrow um, just to, to give it a shot right away. And you can jump in and, and watch us and participate in class if you wish. And and we'll also figure out a way for me to test you on, on your labs. But remember, if you want to just look at how Discord screen sharing works, mm -hmm. probably what I'll do is find a place where we can either do a shared whiteboard. Have you ever seen one of these websites? It's like we both can draw on the same whiteboard yeah. together. I'll find something like that. You'll see. It's it's interactive, and it allows me to ask you some questions and have you answer via that. Okay, perfect. Okay, we will find a way. All right, thanks, everybody. See you next time. I have a question for you. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I got the email for like the starters of like when to go to class and everything. Yes. Mine is on Tuesdays when my name is not on that email you had sent. Whoops. That's because I, I messed up. Um, it's okay. Like I've built PCs. Um, I've been working in IT for three years now. Cool. So I know how to do it all, but I yeah. would like to come to class. I, uh, you need to, if you physically can come to class, you need to while we can. And if you've already done this stuff and it's easy for you, then you're going to breeze through it. It's going to be pretty, pretty quick and easy for you. And if you, uh, it's tougher to now with COVID because you guys have to stay socially distanced. But right. if you help right. the other other folks, I give you points. 
Um, exactly. That's the only point I would like to go to class is just to help the others. That's appreciated. And that that will count towards your towards your your grade. Basically, at some point we're gonna do the full take apart. Did you come last time? Did we assign you a turd? No. No, okay. I, uh, that was the thing is I had got the email, but I saw Daniel Henson. I thought you just didn't know my name. Oh gosh. No, and, we, I probably just typoed. So it's um you are Tuesday section? Yes. Yes. And I am. okay, you can it's pretty tight at 5 p.m. Can you come at 6? Six? 6 would work the best because I get off work at 5. Sold. Perfect then. Come tomorrow at 6 p.m. And it'll take you two seconds to do the lab we did last time. Basically, you we pick, a, we pick a turd, make sure it works, and it's your turd for the rest of the semester. We put your name on it. Can I bring my own turd? If you want to. All it has to do is post. And then hey, you, it, you, it have will. To, you have to be willing and able to take it apart. And you might not want to haul it back and forth every time, but you're welcome to leave it there. We definitely put your name on it very securely. Um, it's okay. It was an old Lenovo business uh, workstation okay. that we pulled out of a client. I so. mean, basically, what we have there is similar to that. So you can, if you really want that one, you can. But you can save yourself the trouble. Rob's got fifty computers that used to be bank computers. They're boring as hell. They're pretty easy to work on. Oh, okay. And they're there, and I'll just give you one of those. We verify right. that it posts. And then I open you open up the side of it so I know that you know how to open it. And then yes. I say point to the power supply, the RAM, the processor. It'll be very easy for you. It'll take 10 seconds. All right, sounds good. And uh that's what we'll do. And then we'll do the next lab, which is going to be a a here's two thousand dollars. Get on PC part picker and build me a computer or pick me out a pre-built one for this specific purpose and mm -hmm. then explain to the class why you chose what you chose. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow. All right. Gotcha. Great. It'd be great to see you there. Um, and thanks for coming tonight. All right. Sounds good. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. Oh, uh, it's Ooh. in uh, what classroom is it in? G102. G102. Okay. Yeah. You know where Rob's office is? Uh, the faculty by, office. It's a basement of the G building. Yeah, that's like by. I mean, is that where like the IT like help desk is at? I don't know, but I know the G building is on the kind of north side. It's mm -hmm. over by dental hygienics and all that stuff. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're upstairs, and mm -hmm. G basement on the south end. Meaning, you know, like if John A. Logan's a donut with the grass mm -hmm. and the ponds in the center, it's yeah. near the center of the donut on the G basement. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. See you there. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye.